Yeah, so uh, good to see uh, a lot of you come out here uh, to see a company with a kind of racist sounding name. I'm really sorry about that. <laughs> it's, uh, uh, it, it, it means uh, sort of corner store in Norwegian. So um, I think if we were to take it to America, we would make a different brand name. But yeah, uh, I'm going to talk about um, uh, online grocery uh, a little bit, uh, a little bit our, about our journey and then how we've been using Lean Startup um, uh, well, both in, in sort of setting up the company, but also in our daily experiments. So uh, very quickly, um, quick intro about myself and, and a little bit of colonial history. That sounds really bad. <laughs> but uh, yeah, no, I went to LSE, um, met my wife, drank a lot of beer, and then I started a small company. It eventually failed, uh, but in between there, I worked for McKinsey, and uh, I noticed Guy Kawasaki saying yesterday that um, uh, you know, McKinsey sells two by two matrices. So that's not true. That's BCG, they do two by two. At McKinsey, we do three by three, which is of course twice as good as, as two by two. That's nine, you know, more than twice as good. Um, so uh, yeah, so then, um, uh, then we actually started uh, working on Colonial once. Oh, that's the wrong button. Um, we started working on uh, Colonial once uh, in, in 2012, uh, around there. I tried to raise a lot of money, didn't really work. Uh, then I worked for a big media company uh, making classified sites. Uh, I had a couple of kids and I read Lean Startup uh, and that actually made a really big difference uh, for us. And then we, then we launched the, the company with, with a team that, that's still in place uh, in 2013 uh, and, and it's been a really great journey and, and as mentioned, we, we just closed last round, uh, our last round uh, last week which is great. So, um, first of all, I think any, uh, any good um, uh, startup, any good company is based on a monetizable pain. That's Andreessen Horowitz. And I've put up a picture of the monetizable pain that we're addressing. Uh, it's a situation that you don't really want to be in uh, and you're willing to pay to get out of it. Uh, I think the thing that makes this potentially disruptive is that it's possible to do online grocery at uh, discount prices. Uh, and so Norway is a tiny little country. Eric Ries was there talking about Lean Startup and, uh, and we presented our uh, case uh, and, and then he, he invited us over here. So it's a small country, we we're five million people, but the grocery market in Norway alone is about 30, 40% bigger than the entire uh, world music uh, market or 20% yeah, bigger. Uh, so, so groceries is really big. Um, and even a small country, you'll have a, you'll have a really um, big addressable market. And I think those are the two important things. You need a monetizable pain, you need to have um, some potential uh, in your business. And grocery kind of checks those boxes. And so when we started, um, we were inspired by particularly the UK, which, is, which are fairly advanced when it comes to online grocery. Um, about six to seven percent of all food that's being sold in the UK now is being sold through online grocery companies. Um, so that was, that was part of the inspiration. And I, in a sense, I feel, you know, when, when I talked to other entrepreneurs, we're, we kind of cheated a little bit because we, we knew that there was a product market fit before we started. So that wasn't really what we were needed to test. Uh, we knew that Norwegians were, were um, uh, one of the most uh, online or biggest online shoppers in the world. So we bought lots of stuff online, but there were no real uh, grocery offerings at the time. Um, but given that, we knew that when the Brits were buying at the levels that they were, we figured that Norwegians should be as well. Uh, so, so that was kind of the, the foundation, but then when we started out, we had to sort of look at it from, from the bottom up again and say, what are sort of the key uh, needs that we're uh, filling here? And um, I think in, in when you buy groceries, you know, one thing is about being inspired, finding out what items to buy. Um, it can be kind of confusing in a big, big grocery store, but, but one way or another, you're going to you're gonna sort of get your impulses and, and figure out what you, what you wanna buy. Um, and the other part is that you want this to happen as cheaply as possible and as smoothly as possible. So those are kind of the two, two things that, that, um, that are important. And if you think about it, uh, a normal traditional grocery store, uh, you're basically trying to combine those two um, in one format, right? So that's why at least big discount supermarkets are, are one, one side of it is, is, is retail, the other is basically a warehouse. You know, so you're walking around in, in, in a warehouse and you're trying to combine uh, these, two, these two things, the, the sort of inspiration part with the, the cheap uh, part or the cost-effective part. Um, 
And, and online, the great thing about online is you can separate the two. So you have your bits and bytes that covers all the inspiration and stuff. You know, at, at the end of the day, it's just about making a really smooth user experience and, and out of that just pops a shopping list. And between that and the rest, uh, online grocery has more in common with industries, logistics, than it has retail. Uh, it's about picking efficiently, it's about uh, you know, shipping efficiently, uh, and, and not to mention doing it um, at a high quality and, and correct, and don't make mistakes. So those are, but those are the fundamental needs. Um, uh, can I all take the first part, uh, the sort of the user experience part? Uh, we, we, uh, we focus, of course, on, on sort of the individual items that you can buy, but we also have a lot of recipes. Uh, recipes are important uh, for us. Uh, most shopping baskets that we sell uh, include one or more recipes. Uh, it's, it's basically a great way um, to kind of uh, integrate uh, knowledge into your shopping experience. I think most of you, if you've been to the grocery store, um, at least the way it is in Norway, uh, very, very few people have more than, let's say, 10 recipes that just go on rotation. Those are the things that you know how to make, you know what, you know, uh, you know what to buy to make those things. And, and that just goes on repeat because you're there, your blood sugar's low, um, you know, you're, not, you're not knowledgeable at the moment when you're actually doing the, the shopping. Whereas online, of course, you can just present hundreds, thousands of recipes. Um, of course, you personalize this, you make it targeted. Um, you, you know what kind of dishes that you usually buy, and then, and then you can kind of present stuff that, that, um, that hits you. Um, but it's easy. You, you click on lasagna, you get everything you need for lasagna. And you can adjust, of course, how many people you are and, and so on. So, so that, that, that part of it is, is important. The second that we see a lot of our customers doing is just uh, making um, existing lists. Uh, let's say like your weekly base, uh, basics, um, your milk, your, your bread, um, eggs, and so on. Um, and if you think about it, uh, if, you, if you make one of those lists and you add a couple of dinners, you're about 90, 80, you know, 80, 90% done uh, at that point. Uh, you have you know, pretty much everything you need. The remainder is, of course, the, the stuff that you need to kind of um, buy on an irregular basis, like your toothpaste or whatever. And of course, search, the search field is, is easy for that. Um, overall, the purpose of this is to make a shopping list that you're happy with, um, that makes you hopefully able to cook more diverse foods than you were before, uh, and, and very importantly, to do it very quickly. Uh, and we see that uh, overall our shopping carts um, are yeah, they're around $150 on average, which is, at least in Norway, is about five to six times bigger than your average shopping basket in a traditional store, which means that people are buying for the entire week, um, and, and um, it allows them to kind of plan um, and buy more efficiently. Um, so that's, that's an important part of it. Um, that's the kind of the user, user side. And then when you go behind the curtain, uh, then you're down to the, uh, the operations of the business. We, we, have, uh, you know, we have our own warehouse. We, we um, source all our items to our warehouse. Uh, it's, a, it's a fairly big one. Uh, it's about the size of two football stadiums. The, not the entire stadium, but the pitch. And I try to, these are three trucks right there, and that's our warehouse. Um, and I think for, for most of you, you, you know, you're familiar maybe with Instacart. Um, yeah, some of you heard about it. Um, well, Instacart's on, on sort of one end of the spectrum, and Amazon is on the other. Uh, and the spectrum I'm talking about is basically sort of your OPEX, CAPEX um, uh, sort of situation. So Instacart uh, is no CAPEX, but also very high OPEX. Right, so they, they're building their entire um, you know, business on top of the grocery store. So you have all the costs of a regular traditional store, and then you put, put the picking costs and the distribution costs on top of that, which makes it fairly expensive. So, so Instacart, as, as I understand, is probably 20% or more um, uh, expensive than, than your sort of discount stores. So that's one end of it. Then you have sort of the Amazon or Ocado in, in Britain, Tesco, which have these massive, massive warehouses that are very, very automated, but they're extremely expensive to, to invest in. Uh, and it does drive operational costs down, but not enough, in our opinion. So there's a, there's a space between here where you can make your own warehouses. Uh, it doesn't, we don't require, we're not automated. We, we pick with people, but we use software to make them very efficient at picking. And there are some things you can do there and some ways to organize it so that you can actually start pushing down towards the operational costs of these very high capex type of solutions 
uh, but without the capex. Uh, and what that means is that you can build smaller warehouses and more of them. And that, of course, reduces distribution cost. So, um, so this is the, so we, we feel that there's a middle, there's a model in the middle here that, that we, um, that we think has a, has a lot of potential and we see uh, in Norway that, it, that it's uh, running very well and it's, uh, and it's a very, very efficient model overall. Uh, so right now, yeah, we're, we're uh, processing about 600,000 items uh, per week in, in, in this warehouse. <clears throat> um, on the distribution side, it's very interesting. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about an example uh, where we use Lean Startup uh, for our pickup points. But we, we're in the Oslo area. Um, we, we serve uh, in, in the areas that we cover. There's about 2 million people. Of course, that's not a lot by American standards, but it's, uh, it's about 40% of the Norwegian population. Um, we, we have pickup points uh, that, I'm, that I'll get back to where, where uh, the customer picks up their items. Um, and, and, but we do both. So we do home delivery and, and we do pickup points. Um, I should also say that, uh, so given, sort of talking about market size, uh, as I mentioned, the, the Norwegian market for, for groceries is about $20 billion. But the turnover that we have now on 2 million people is about the same turnover as Instacart had last year when they were valued at 2 billion American dollars. So clearly, we have started this in the wrong country. Uh, uh, so yeah, so there's a, I guess there's about a 20 times higher um, uh, valuation over uh, earnings uh, multiple here in the US. Uh, but still, it's, it's, it's big for us. So, um, so this is how it works. You know, we have a big warehouse. We, we have a big fleet of cars, and we have these pickup points, and, and that's, that's the gist of it. Uh, and it's possible to do that. I mean, the, the point I was making earlier about Instacart building their costs on top of the store structure, the point here is, of course, you, you replace one with the other, right? So we don't have stores, but we have a warehouse. And I can tell you that sort of the square footage and the turnover per square foot at, at our warehouse is in a completely different league than what it would be in a normal retail setting. You know, warehouse space is cheap and there's a lot of turnover in, in one spot. So that's where you save a lot of money. And then, of course, you have some added costs, particularly in the distribution network, which is where the, the picker points come in. So that's what they look like. Nothing much. Uh, pretty unassuming. Uh, but this is the world's most efficient way of delivering groceries. And it looks like nothing. <laughs> but I'll explain a little bit about how, how they work. So, but before I, before I go that, um, I go there. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about sort of the, the learnings we did from, um, from uh, trying to start it once uh, and then and what we did to sort of get it right the second time. And uh, in, in 2011, 2012, uh, you know, we, we saw that the grocery, uh, online grocery business uh, was going to be big and sort of naturally we figured, all right, let's, let's go in, let's go in heavy, let's raise $10 million, let's build a big warehouse from the get-go, uh, a bunch of picker points, um, and, and try to scale it uh, as, as, as quick as we could. Uh, and we, we try to race it. I put a little chessboard there, and because this, we were, you know, we were kind of just strategizing, right? We had a business plan. We didn't really, we didn't try to sell anything. We were trying to sell our business plan, basically. And my uh, co-founder and I used to sit around and play chess a lot while waiting for, uh, for, for investors and and, uh, and stuff to get back to us. We ended up we raised about five million dollars, but it wasn't enough to sort of get started, and uh, so we so we kind of abandoned it. But we didn't we didn't give up the the concept. Uh, but we gave up that, that model, basically starting it with, with a lot of, lot of money and, and the taking from there uh, didn't really work. There wasn't enough investor appetite. Uh, and I think that even if we were to raise those 10 million, uh, we would not have uh, gotten the same outcome as we, we had today. Uh, I don't even think we would be able to, do, um, to, to, to scale it really any faster uh, than we have. And, and secondly, we would have had a completely different uh, dilution at this point if we had done that. If we had raised $10 million to begin with, we would have basically started from day one owning a small minority stake. Uh, instead, uh, we've capitalized it up now, and, and the founders, um, up until the last round, had about 70% of the company still. So, uh, so it, I don't think, I mean, that's not the most important thing, but I also think it, it was actually uh, easier to make a successful company uh, starting small, which is, which is what we did. Because we, uh, we, um, we sort of kept the idea on the back burner while having uh, separate uh, normal uh, jobs. Um, and then we figured, you know, I read Lead Startup and I thought, is there any way where we can start this uh, small and kind of prove value early uh, so that we can get a better, better valuation when we scale up? And, and what we did um, was we found uh, a team. So Colonial was actually started by, by 10 founders. So we were a pretty big founding team from the start. 
we, we took in very, very little capital, and we just put in a lot of hours instead. Um, so we, we, we sort of split the company between us. Um, the team was basically you know, front-end developers and designers on one hand, uh, full-stack developers, because we built everything. We built the whole warehouse system, the picking system, distribution system, all of it is built uh, from the bottom up. Uh, we looked at buying um, software, particularly for the warehouse part, um, because that, you know, we would think that that's kind of off the shelf stuff. Uh, warehouses, there's a lot of them. Uh, so you would think that they, have, they had some good, good stuff, but we just didn't think that the software was good enough. And groceries is a little bit special uh, when it comes to, to e-commerce because you have really big baskets, um, so a lot of items per order, uh, and, and typically from a fairly small number of, of SKUs. Uh, so, I mean, you have uh, Amazon has millions of, of SKUs, right? Um, but actually, we only have 5,000, and out of those 5,000, I'd say about three, 400 of those items account for 95% of our volume. So, so that kind of that distribution actually makes a lot of um, uh, it, it, it makes a lot of difference on, on sort of what kind of system you make. So, so we didn't feel that any of the systems that were there really worked uh, for that kind of uh, kind of uh, uh, distribution. Um, so we uh, so we built our own. Uh, but so basically, it's, it's you know it was, at the end of the day, it was seven of us were were software uh, people, and then the three of us were were uh, logistics operations and, and business people. Uh, and we didn't take any salary, uh, and in fact, we, we, we didn't raise uh, a lot of money until, until we were able to prove value. So this is, this is our weekly sales. Um, this is the beginning of, of uh, 2014 was when we started uh, selling. We, in the beginning, we didn't really market at all. It, it, it seems like nothing now, but it was enough. Uh, the idea that we only spent about three months f from founding the company until we delivered our first order. We got a really small warehouse, we rented it, uh, it was about 5,000 square feet. Uh, we had a pretty low selection of items, and we did our picking mostly ourselves. Uh, we hired a couple of people um, in the beginning, but the whole, the whole idea was that we could stay there for, for, uh, for a year and, and sort of build our concept and then go into the market, but we, instead we built a front end that was pretty good, a warehouse system that was okay, uh, but it was a start, uh, and then we were able to continue to build on those systems while we had sales. So we didn't, the sales that you see here were not to make profit, it was just to get some items through the system to learn how the customers used our, our front end um, and to, to develop our, our warehouse system so that it could scale. Uh, and it took us, um, yeah, about, about a year uh, until, we, um, uh, until we were able to, to, to start scaling. Uh, we increased the selection of items, we reduced our prices, and pretty immediately when we did that, um, our sales went up about 300% over a couple of weeks, and then we were maxed out at the warehouse we were at. Uh, so so we, um, we got a second warehouse around here. That's, the, that's spring, about a year and a half ago. Uh, and then we, were kind of, then we were ready to scale. And we had our Series A around here. I'll, I'll, I'll show you. But so, so in, this, in those, this whole period, you know, we just build, measure, learn. That's, that's what we did. Um, and, and, and through that, we, we, uh, we were able to look at retention rates. We were, getting, you know, we were getting metrics that were important to show the value of the company, even though we were at a small, uh, small volumes. Um, our Series A round was here in, in, um, in March last year. And, and up until then, and this is a, this is a capital intensive business. Uh, you know, if you're doing software, you can do that, that fairly cheaply, but we needed, we needed some money, right? We needed to, to invest in, in, uh, in infrastructure, uh, you know, steel and, and cement and cars and, and stuff. So, so, so getting to sort of our Series A with less than a million dollars is, is something that we're pretty proud of, and I, I don't think it would have worked if we didn't have this lean startup mindset. We really tried to you know, turn every dollar um, and, and save money as, as, as well as we could because we knew that, um, you know, if we were able to, to, to do something cheaply now and we were able to postpone getting, you know, needing the money for another six months, it's actually going to make a big difference in, in how much we were diluted. So, so uh, yeah, so finally, uh, our Series A round, uh, about $30 million in valuation uh, and, and less than a million dollars up to that point in capital, uh, which, is, which is why the founders uh, still own at that point uh, 80% or so. Uh, and then we... Then we were sort of uh, rigging, rigging up to scale. We, we got a new warehouse here. Uh, we, were, we didn't want to start our marketing before the summer break. This is, these are the summer months last year. So that's a, that's a year ago, or a little over a year ago. So we began marketing there. 
and then it just completely exploded. So, and, and this, this, I mean, it, you know, if you do software, you, you buy some more servers here, but for, if you're an online grocery company and you're growing, which we did for 30 weeks uh, straight, and we were, by the way, we were the biggest in Norway at that point, uh, and we grew 7% per week, um, com compounded for about 30 weeks straight. Uh, and my COO was sitting over there, and I don't think he slept for a year. But uh, just hiring people, getting cars, um, yeah, and building things up. Uh, this, these numbers are actually a bit old, but we're up here somewhere now. Um, but, but what I wanted to, to, to show was also that this, this kind of period where we've been doing things low scale, um, you know, learning, learning what mistakes not to do, uh, making mistakes while volumes were still low, so, so you know, not too expensive to fix. Um, that meant that when we started scaling, um, we were able to deal with, with that in a much better way. Uh, and I also think that our product, uh, once we started putting on marketing on it, our product was a strong one, uh, and, and, uh, and that's why you saw, see this growth, um, which, was, which had a marketing return of about one to 25. So as we spent, as we spent roughly a million dollars in marketing, we got uh, $25 million back in, in sort of annualized revenue. So um, just a very, very um, simple uh, experiment or a simple example of, of how we use Lean Startup um, for, uh, for actual projects. Um, this is the pickup uh, point story that I alluded to earlier. Uh, the self-service pickup points that you see here uh, were the fifth iteration of, of trying to build a, a good pickup point system. And um, we started really small. We, we set up a pickup point at a, in a big Norwegian um, uh, office building. Uh, and it was just to kind of get a bit of a fishbowl type of thing where, because you, you could reach your customers fairly easily, you can, you can talk to them, and you're able to look at sort of conversion rates and stuff in this kind of close environment. Um, it was never really meant to be uh, our final model, but we learned a lot from it. So we, we knew, of course, uh, you know, we found out that that the, the people driving were, were our customers, uh, people taking the bus or biking to work, for instance, was, was completely out of the question. Um, so the so next thing was we figured, all right, well, you know, we're, we're targeting people who drive cars, we should do some sort of drive-through uh, pickup model. And in the beginning, we did that while, um, while serving it ourselves. We also sort of pivoted that up to, to starting to do container-based uh, pickup points at gas stations, at big, um, uh, big roads uh, in and out of the city. Uh, we, but we're still, you know, we're still a bit too expensive, right? So particularly um, when you have someone there, uh, you, have, you have to have some sort of opening hours, and in, those, in that period you have someone at, at the location that you have to pay, uh, and that's expensive. So we, eventually we started cooperating with the gas stations where actually the gas stations themselves, the employees at the gas station did the, did the delivery. Um, it was a, a model that... Um, uh, that was cheaper, uh, particularly when building a, a sort of a network of pickup points early with lower volumes. Uh, you know, it was better to pay the gas station a set fee per delivery than having fixed costs. But um, and, but these these and these were all iterations. But we, we still felt felt that there was um, you know it was possible. It should be possible to do this much much cheaper. Um, and and a lot of our competitors had sort of given up somewhere along here. Uh, a lot of other concepts that have been tried out, placing a, a truck at a certain location, um, but then you know and that stuff didn't really work. So then they, they gave it up. But we we were completely, uh, you know, religiously, uh, we had a religious religious belief that this was the efficient model to do it. I think using people's own motion, you know, to to cover the last the cost of the last mile, is a lot smarter than doing than doing these uh, individual deliveries. But in order to get to the efficiency levels that we wanted, we realized that you couldn't have people involved in this. So, so we built the, um, we built the, the, the self-service pickup points. And the first thing, I mean, this, these are, there's a code panel on it, and there's a camera inside. Um, if there, it, it can fit around 30 orders. And if there are 30 orders one day, then each of those 30 customers, they will have physical access to everyone's items. And I bet a lot of you are thinking, like, that's, that's crazy, right? Like, you would just, wouldn't, wouldn't someone just go in there and take everything? Uh, and that was what we were worried about too. Uh, so, so the the natural thing to do was to test it. So we built one, uh, very simple. Uh, our coders uh, made made a made a simple hack to to, to make sort of the the pass uh, the the door lock work and and the camera. 
Um, and, and we tried. And, and uh, well, now we have about 30 picker points, and I'm guessing we've had around 40 or 50,000 deliveries at this point. And, and um, how, many, how many times do you think there's been theft out of those 50,000? Yeah, yeah, zero. So it's never happened, right? And you can ask yourself, so why, why is that? And this is what we were worried about. And, and that's why I think Lean Startup is, is about, is you have these assumptions, and the whole world had made assumptions about that. That's why they made things into lockers. And lockers are very efficient and very expensive, because there's a lot of empty space. And the big box is just so much deeper. Uh, but that, and the assumption was that, well, it's, you know, security. People just, ah, oh, security. And then the discussion over. Uh, but I think that's what Lean Startup is about, is that, you know, are you really sure? I mean, groceries is a terrible sort of second-hand type of thing to sell. So if you're a criminal, there's a lot of, not a lot of value <laughs> in, in stealing random groceries and then trying to sell it for drugs or something. <laughs> so so that's, that's one thing. So you're not going to get sort of the, you know, the, the clever criminals that are trying to game this um, because they're, they'll just rob a jewelry store or something and there'll be more money in it. Um, Secondly, I mean, it's, it's enough to have, I mean, it's still only our customers have access, right? And, and if they go in there, they get filmed. If anything were to be lost, we would go back on the film, see who was sort of roaming around, and we would have a very you know, uncomfortable phone call to that person. And that's, I think that's enough. Um, so, so now, you know, um, the great thing about this and, um, is, is the potential. And, and this, the thing here is that we will take a big truck, we'll do five times 30 orders, you know, 150 orders, it'll do five drops, and it'll, it'll have delivered 150 uh, orders uh, in that time. And that's a lot cheaper than doing 150 individual uh, deliveries. So finally, it's my last minute, um, and I guess we have one minute then for questions after. Uh, my take on, on sort of uh, on, on Lean Startup, I think um, it's, it's imperative that you test stuff, and that's what Lean Startup is all about, build, measure, learn. Um, but I think that there is sort of, there's one obvious thing missing from, from the equation of building value, and that's that you need to have some potential, something real that you're testing. Uh, that's, of course, the magic juice. I think if it wasn't for sort of point one here, you would really read Lean Startup and we would all be millionaires, right? Because you would just test. But the magic juice is actually testing stuff that makes a difference. And, and to do, the, you know, the pickup point example, uh, that has cut our, I mean, an average delivery from, from one of our pickup points is at about 20% of the cost of doing a home delivery. So an 80% cost cut. Um, that's massive. So that's, that's a lot of potential. And, and uh, the point here is, I think, you know, building really good, you know, having really good ideas, uh, addressing problems that, that are, are big, that's, that's one part of it. That's the angle of the spiral. Uh, but if you do that and you don't test, that's zero. I mean, lots of number one and zero number two, zero. If you, but also at the same time, if you just test stuff that doesn't matter, that's zero too. So, so this, I think this is the, you know, I guess pretty obvious, but, but I still feel it. You know, I look around, there's a lot of testing going on, and, and I, you know, that's great, but, but it, you got to test something that makes a difference. So, uh, yeah, lean startup spiral. I don't know, Eric uh, can take it, I guess, because he, he, he has the base for it. But, uh, yeah, no, I think, I think that's, the, that's, that's sort of the, the learning. I don't know, is there, uh, we have a few seconds left if there's any, any questions. Okay.